Hello and welcome back. My guess is until now, you just thought that tuning a uh, transceiver to a desired frequency was about all you needed to know to make contacts anywhere and at any time, day or night. If life were just that simple. In this lesson, we will learn how radio waves propagate and a few special conditions that might allow us to communicate better and further. Are you ready to learn? Well, let's get started. This video is lesson three, part three of my amateur radio technician class license course covering the 2022 to the 2026 question pool. I'm your instructor. My name is Gary Stevens and my call sign is Kilo Echo 2 Golf Sierra. I hold an amateur extra license and I've been an amateur operator since 2001. Uh, an amateur extra since 2014 and teaching amateur radio for over 15 years now. The T3 section covers radio wave propagation. On your exam, three questions are selected at random from this sub element. There are three groups and a total of 34 questions. This video covers the third group, T3C propagation modes, which includes sporadic E, meteor scatter, auroral propagation, tropospheric ducting, F region skip, and light of sight and radio horizon. We should know that simplex UHF signals are rarely heard beyond the radio horizon because UHF signals are usually not propagated by the ionosphere. While HF waves bounce off the ionosphere, UHF waves pass right through it. That's why it's common to see UHF uplinks used in amateur satellites. The exam question is, why are simplex UHF signals rarely heard beyond their radio horizon? A, they are too weak to go very far. B, FCC regulations prohibit them from going more than 50 miles. C, UHF signals are usually not propagated by the ionosphere, or D, UHF signals are absorbed by the ionospheric D region. The correct answer is C, UHF signals are usually not propagated by the ionosphere. We should know that a characteristic of HF communication when compared to the communications on VHF and higher frequency is that long distance ionosphere Spheric propagation is far more common on HF. HF waves bounce off the ionosphere and reflect downward. This slide illustrates a wave being propagated from the west coast via the ionosphere to the east coast. Our exam question is, what is a characteristic of HF communication compared with communications on VHF and higher frequencies? A, HF antennas are generally smaller. B, HF accommodates wider bandwidth signals. C, long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common on HF. Or D, there is less atmospheric interference or static on HF. The correct answer is C, long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common on HF. It would be wise for you to know that a characteristic of VHF signals received via auroral backscatter is they are distorted and signal strength varies considerably. An aurora occurs after a solar storm. When the electrons reach the Earth's thin upper atmosphere, they collide with the nitrogen and oxygen molecules, sending them into an excited state. The excited electrons eventually calm down and release light, which is what we see in the aurora. For some, an aurora is a beautiful sight to see, but to amateur radio operators, it's an indicator that some dramatic changes to radio propagation may occur. This could range from degraded performance on the HF amateur radio bands, while at VHF, it can give rise to a unique form of radio propagation commonly known as auroral backscatter. The text question is, what is the characteristic of a VHF signal received via auroral backscatter? 
A, they are often received from 10,000 miles or more. B, they are distorted and signal strength varies considerably. C, they occur during the winter nighttime hours. Or D, they're generally strongest when your antenna is aimed west. The answer is, of course, B. They are distorted and the signal strength varies considerably. You should also understand that sporadic E is a type of propagation that is most commonly associated with occasional strong signals on the 10, 6, and 2 meter bands from beyond the radio horizon. A thin cloud layer composed of ionic particles left behind by micrometeoroids burning up in the atmosphere forms a sporadic E layer. It behaves similarly to the ionosphere. On your exam, you may see this question. Which of the following types of propagation is most commonly associated with occasional strong signals on the 10, 6, and 2 meter bands from beyond the radio horizon? A, backscatter, B, sporadic E, C, D region absorption, or D, gray line propagation? The correct answer is B, sporadic E. Know that the effects of knife-head diffraction may allow radio signals to travel beyond obstructions between the transmitting and receiving stations. Diffraction is a phenomenon where radio waves bend around corners to reach places which are otherwise not reachable or not in a straight line of sight. In technical jargon, such regions are also sometimes called shadowed regions, a term that comes from the physics of light. Our question reads, which of the following effects may allow a radio signal to travel beyond obstructions between the transmitting and receiving stations? A, knife edge diffraction, B, Faraday rotation, C, quantum tunneling, or D, Doppler shift? with the correct answer being A, knife edge diffraction. Know that tropospheric ducting is responsible for allowing over the horizon VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis. This slide shows a rare snapshot of the troposphere. In my experience, tropospheric ducting is most likely to be associated with fog. Thermal inversions create fog. We cover that in another slide. The farthest I've ever been able to talk during tropospheric ducting was while driving to work from Johnson Space Center. I could contact a mobile station in Dallas, Texas, some 250 miles away. On the exam, you may see this question. What type of propagation is responsible for allowing over the horizon VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis? A, tropospheric ducting. B, D region refraction. C, F2 region refraction. Or D, Faraday rotation. The answer is A, tropospheric ducting. For the exam, you should know the six meter band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter. Scientists estimate that some 48 plus tons of meteoratic material fall on the earth each day. As a meteor passes through our atmosphere, it creates an ion trail. The ion trails left behind can be exploited for radio communications in the six meter band. The exam question is, what band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? A, 33 centimeters, B, 6 meters, C, 2 meters, or D, 70 centimeters? And the correct answer is B, 6 meters. Understand that temperature inversions in the atmosphere cause tropospheric ducting. Tropospheric ducting happens when there is a temperature inversion or thermal inversion. It creates a reversal of the normal behavior of temperature in the troposphere. The troposphere is a region of the atmosphere nearest to the Earth's surface. 
During inversion, a layer of cold air mass at the surface is under a warm air mass above it. The test question is, what causes tropospheric ducting? A, discharges of lightning during an electrical storm. B, sunspots and solar flares. C, updrafts from hurricanes and tornadoes. D, temperature inversions in the atmosphere. The correct answer being D, temperature inversions in the atmosphere. From dawn to shortly after sunset, during periods of high sunspot activity, is the best time for long distance 10 meter band propagation via the F region. For 10 meters to travel long distances, it needs to skip off the ionized F2 layer in the ionosphere. Under rare conditions, after solar activity, 10 meter signals can travel greater distances. Since the F1 and F2 layers combine at night, F2 refraction is, for the most part, impossible during that time period. What is generally the best time for long distance 10 meter band propagation via the F region? A, from dawn until shortly after sunset during periods of high sunspot activity. B, from shortly after sunset to dawn during periods of high sunspot activity. C, from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of low sunspot activity. Or D, from shortly after sunset to dawn during periods of low sunspot activity. The correct answer is from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high sunspot activity. The six and 10 meter bands may provide long distance communications via the ionosphere's F region during the peak of the sunspot cycle. F2 skip affects not only the upper ends of the HF spectrum, such as 10 meters, but it also affects the low end of the VHF spectrum or six meters. Propagation for that range is best during the peak of the sunspot cycle. The exam question looks like this. Which of the following bands may provide long distance communications via the ionosphere's F2 region during the peak of the sunspot cycle? A, six and 10 meters. B, 23 centimeters. C, 70 centimeters and one and a quarter meters. Or D, all these choices are correct. The correct answer is of course, a, six and 10 meters. We need to know that the reason why the radio horizon for VHF and UHF signals is more distant than the visible horizon is because the atmosphere refracts radio waves slightly. We know that radio waves like light love to travel in a straight line. Still, both can slightly bend during the right conditions. Atmospheric refraction causes such deviations of light or electromagnetic waves. As it passes through the atmosphere, variation in air density can cause a slight bending of the waves. The exam question is, why is the radio horizon for VHF and UHF signals more distant than the visual horizon? A radio signals move somewhat faster than the speed of light. B, radio waves are not blocked by dust particles. C, the atmosphere refracts radio waves slightly. Or D, radio waves are blocked by dust particles. The correct answer being C, the atmosphere refracts radio waves slightly. This is the end of lesson three, part three. I hope you're enjoying learning and working towards earning your technician license. If you have any questions, leave them below. By clicking the like button, it can help others decide whether this course is worth investing their time in, uh, in learning or not. Brian Herbert, the author of the science fiction novel Dune said, the capacity to learn is a gift the ability to learn is a skill. The willingness to learn is a choice.
I'm glad you're making the choice to stick with this series. Soon you'll be able to talk on the radio with your license, and perhaps even we can talk over the airwaves someday. Until next time, my friends, never stop learning.